are recording here. Oops. Um, okay, so uh, in order to find people's current age, there's a little bit of a, of a trick that's used with this model. And it's a trick that saves, can save quite a bit of effort if you know it, if you have certain needs, okay? So you'll notice the function called current age. That function obtains their current age, okay? There's actually no variable called age here. If, we're, if we wanted to keep track of people's age, um, can anyone mention some, we're gonna talk about one way of doing it here, but what would be one alternative way of, of keeping track of a person's, uh, person's age, say membership in a couple age groups. Suppose we had 17 age groups, um, uh, five year age groups, you know, zero to four, five through nine, 10 through 14, and then all the way up to, your, to, to 80, um, 80 plus. Suppose we had that, that was what we wanted to keep track of. What would be one way of keeping track of that in any logic for a given person? What might we do? We want to keep track of what age group someone was in. Okay. Good. Good. And, and you're anticipating exactly how this model works. So, so that's good. And personally, I think that is one of the best ways to do it. I'm trying to stir up a little bit of discussion of alternatives. Sorry? You want the bad way. I, I want, not necessarily a bad way. It turns out that a, a way that has some, um, some things to recommend it as well, but, uh, uh, but it's different from that. So instead of having it as a function yeah. of birthday and current time, yeah. you have a variable that increments for every age in the model Good. at every time step. Good, at every time step. Or indeed, let's suppose you just want to know five year age category for someone, it, uh, or say, Say every you distinguish it age zero, age one, age two to start with. Uh, you might have that increment every year, for example, right? Um, you could have an event that wakes the person up and says, "It's your birthday," um, and and they wake up and their 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 age is imp uh, incremented, right? Um, so we could have an event. That might be one way. It won't be another way to store information about what age group they're in. Good, good. That's exactly it. Because really, if you think about it, age is an aspect of their state, right? Something is changing over time. And it changes in a particularly regular, structured way. So, you know, it, it might seem a little bit odd to represent a state chart, but, but it could be used indeed. And so you could have a 17 state state chart where the first state might be ages zero to four, second would be five through nine. And what sort of transitions would there be between them? What would, remember when we have transitions, we have several choices of transition. Would this be a message-based transition or what sort of transition? These are the choices. It would be a timeout. You'd have them transition after exactly five years, they go to the next larger age group. And that's actually a particularly fine way of doing it. It's conceptually simple. It's visually sort of apparent what's going on. Um, there's no need to kind of go from their, their floating point value of age to their age category in some complex way. Um, and, and they also move exactly after five years from age group to age group. By the way, in classic stock and flow modeling, you could have population kept track of by ages zero to four, five through nine, uh, 10 to 14. Um, but typically that is the advancing between them is traditionally dictated by the equivalent of a rate. There's a certain chance per unit time that they go from one to the other and it's say, you know, if, if, if time unit is years, there'd be a chance of 0.2 or one over five, um, they'll transition from one five year age group to the next, for example, because approximately one fifth go on. It turns out that that leads to a sort of smearing out of people's um, ages. So if you had a whole group, you know, sudden influx of people, a, ba a sudden baby boom one year, 
that would actually then ripple through to older age categories pretty quickly because it's only a rough sort of timing that people use. On average, they go in five years, but some go earlier, some go later. And, and yet here, timeout is actually very precise. And so there's a lot to recommend a state chart-based way, but I'll show a way that's an alternative to that that's even more precise. It allows you to have, you know, know in, in quite exact terms how old they are. And it can be used to map to, to, uh, to uh, age categories. Okay, so to get their current age. So what we do in this is when they're first created, when they're first born, we have this variable called appearance time. That's specific to a person, so it's not static. It's, it's a characteristic of that particular person. And its initial value, which never changes, incidentally, is time. What do you think this returns? This, what is time? What does that call to time do? It returns the, yeah, the current time, basically the current model time. Um, and if that's in years, which we're, we're assuming here, um, that's good. And then the current age, let's suppose that, let, let's suppose we put aside the issue of um, the initial population. Let's suppose people are born in 1920.0, and now it's 1960.0. How old are they? They are exactly 40 years old. So. Here we'd have the initial age, uh, excuse me, we, we, don't, we, don't, we wouldn't have to worry about that, then we just have the current time minus the appearance time. And that will give you their current age. Does that make sense? Okay, now the problem is we, it doesn't work in general for the initial population. Why not? Yeah, exactly. So. Uh, it would work if we allowed the initial population to be all babes, uh, you know, of all, all babies. They're born at the initial time. If we were just following a cohort, they're all born at the initial time or later, that would be fine. It's, it's the, you know, 2012 Cambridge cohort study, um, a birth cohort study. But that isn't typically what we want. We typically want one population that, that has, has some ages initially distributed and then from then on when people are born we keep track of it so here we have an initial age okay and that initial age is provided as a parameter so who provides the value for, for a parameter if it's in person who provides the value if, if we have a parameter in person well let's step up <coughs> if we have a parameter in main who provides the value for that parameter and at what time We'd have, if, if we had a parameter in main, in fact, we do. Let us count how many. Um, mean lifespan. Who provides the value for mean lifespan? You remember that? For main. Who provides the value for parameter? Yeah, simulation. Yeah, it's associated with the experiment. These are basically our assumptions, our global assumptions for this experiment, and they're actually specified by simulation. And in general, it's the thing that's responsible for creating you that provides your parameters, um, provides, you, provides your characteristics. So here, if you look down at parameters, this is what specifies the parameters for main. Who specifies the parameters for person? Taking that main. Main provides the parameters for person. That's right. So if we, and, and where in main? Sorry? It's in the population. It's in the population. So each each uh, population can provide the parameters. In fact, you'd see them. You see them here. Uh, here are the the population parameters here. Um, and you'll notice a couple characteristics. We'll come back to here. Okay. But you'll notice this specifies their initial age. Eh. Mm -hmm. Um. So when the population initially created, this specifies the being at a random age, and we could go look at random age to find out you know, what that, um, uh, what that method does. Notice it says person.random age. It's actually a method in, in person because it has something to do with, with personhood. But fundamentally, that information is provided there, their initial age. Now, uh, after that, when a baby is born, what do you think its initial age is? <laughs> if someone walked into this room, they might, 
<laughs> what, what sort of thing is that? Okay, what is their initial age when they're born? Yeah, where do you think pregnant, where do you think babies are born in this model? Yeah, exactly, exactly. So there's a thing called performed birth, and we've seen that before. And at performed birth, what do you think this first parameter is? It's, it's the initial age. See that? So, so their initial age of all babies born in the model is zero. That's a good question. Um, uh, I'm not sure why I did that. I mean, let's let's go see why I did that. Um, it's 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 a good question. Um, it may have it may have complained at some point. Okay, so model build them. Um, no, it built fine. So uh, maybe it was because initial age was initially a. Um, uh, no, it's a double. So yeah, no, you don't have to. Because especially because, especially because look at this. I mean, right now this is a. Um, this is a double that it takes, so no, you don't have to do that cast. Uh, it's automatically, there's an implicit cast there. Yeah, Actually, this zero, as far as Java is concerned, that's an integer. Mm -hmm. And then it says, oh, I got an integer, and I need to make a double out of it, a double precision value. How do I do that? And it, it just does it straightforwardly. It just makes it a 0, 0.0. If I wanted to actually have it be a, a double literal, as it's called, constant, I could do 0.0. .0. Um, okay, folks, so, so uh, here we've kind of seen how this mechanism works, and it's very useful. It's very straightforward. And if we want to find out what age category someone was in, what could we do? Five-year age category, what could we do? Yeah, uh, with the exception of, and you have to be... You, with, with one exception, and what's that exception? If it's five year age categories, if it's 17 age categories, five years up to 80 and then 80 and over, then we'd have to have an exception for 80 and over. If they're, if they're 80 or over, they're in the highest one, otherwise divided by five, and, and, uh, and, and then it's an integer. It would be, be an integer, so um, yeah. Um, there we go. So uh, that's pretty straightforward. Okay, so. Um, so that's, uh, that's handy. Now, let's suppose that we wanted to keep track of, and this is where it comes into collections. Suppose we want to keep track now of, of all the babies that were born to a given person here. How do we do that? OK, so we'd have, we need some place to store them, surely. So let, let's have a, a children. Now, I said array, array list there. Um, array list is good because it's a sequential collection. We get to capture their birth order. Well, that's maybe important. And then we want to be able to add to it easily at the end. That's why I chose that. Uh, we want to be able to add successive ones in at the end. Okay. Um, we could have done a set, which is, a, 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 for example, a, a hash set. Um, that's a type of set. And we could have just had a set of children if we didn't care about their age so much. But here I, I thought, okay, you know, age is kind of important. And then we, we just want to add them in. So an array list sounds good. Um, okay, so that's step one. Now, how would we, how would we add to that? Like, where would we add? Okay, if we want to keep track of who their children are. Yeah. Um, okay. So yeah. So here we're gonna have a birth occur, and then in perform birth, this is this is where the action's at. Can you see that? Children dot add offspring. So implicitly, this should be. I mean, to be to be clear about this, this should be what dot children. It should be really mother dot children. To be to be very clear. Alternatively, it's mother is this um, because that's the one who's transitioning from pregnant to a non-pregnant state. But to be so conceptually clear about it, it's the mother's children to which we're adding the offspring, the record of the offspring. Okay, um, so that's that's all well and good. And if if we wanted to report who the children are of the mother, and I think we we actually had some need to do that like maybe it was when we clicked on this let's go back to dynamic and we can see that um, uh, report children 
and report children is, is this guy here. And all it does is it loops through this. Remember we saw this, this is what I was saying about collections. You can just iterate through them. Children is a collection. Here it's iterating through to each person. We've seen this syntax before in our lecture on Java statements. All this does is it goes through this for each child, which is in this collection, each of those children being a person, the, the, the name P child, person child, uh, is successfully bound to each of them in turn, and then it, it executes the body of the loop. So first it asks, is the child passed away? And if so, um, uh, it said that you know they're, they're, they're dead, otherwise they're alive. Uh, and, uh, and it says they have a population location, you know, this certain thing, child two string. And then, then it increments. Oh, this says I child. Um, oh, we don't really need that anymore. Um, so I could actually clean that up. We don't really need this I child. So, uh, oh, no, no, excuse me, excuse me. Oh, my goodness. Um, I child, no, it doesn't, it doesn't undo it. Um, it, it, I saved it. <laughs> uh, there have been a few times in my life where I've saved too quickly. I child, thank you. Um, I child. Um, index child, the child's index. Why do we need that? It's because of this thing here, my child. Um, so we're going through, we're saying my child, X, you know, number zero, number one, number two. I'm just wondering if you yeah. the Java syntax, can you say I child plus plus in parentheses for every thing that you just done? Yes, you could. Yeah, you could go like this. Yeah, yeah. The problem with that is, okay, so, so that's a great question. Can I do that? Yes, I could. And then I wouldn't need this, but why should I do that? What are the arguments Again. for doing this? Yeah, it allows it to be done all, all at once. What are the arguments against this? Sorry? Overlook it. You can overlook it. You can overlook it. And what might happen if you overlook that? So I would say, uh, I'm going to give my opinion on this. Um, I think this is a recipe for disaster. And, and there, there's a reason for it. What, why do I think this is a recipe for disaster? I mean, it's actually correct. There's nothing wrong with this. It would work just fine. And it's a little bit clever. A little bit clever. You do it all in one line. But there's a, it's a potential recipe for disaster. What is the recipe for disaster? The recipe for disaster, folks, is that, um, and, and again, I, I apologize uh, for, for if I can't articulate this well, but after you, know, after you spent decades doing software development, um, there's things that are different levels of transientness or permanence within your projects. And something that's quite transient is things like uh, informational things you print out. So, th so this prints out some information. So that's great. So you, might remove it later. you might remove it very casually. You say, oh, you know, I'm cl my console window is getting too cluttered up. Um, here's a trace that I don't really need to know, that, you know, the, the, the child. Um, um, or I might rearrange this. I guess this is called report children, so that's unlikely to get to get all removed. But the point is that the, the exact syntax used here, the formatting of it might change a lot. And in short, folks, I might I might go change this um, quite frequently, you know, about this. And I might easily overlook this um, and and forget to put that in there. So Personally, I would be, I feel it's a lot less risky to in fact have a separate line just to visually emphasize that I am, I am changing that. Um, again, perfectly correct. It's just, it's vulnerable to, to differential change rates. The change rate associated with the vagaries of how you want it to be printed out. That if it were not for printing, but for other calculations, that we could do so. Um, yeah, I mean, if this weren't this, I might use it, but I also have to say that if there's too much packed on mm -hmm. one line, okay. sometimes you might miss the fact that that's there. Um, I'll, I'll tell you another thing. Someone might, conceivably, you might do cut and paste, you know, um, uh, you know, something like this, um, and, and their name is, um, you know, um, 
uh, whatever whatever their oops their their name is, and you forget that you've cut and pasted that same um, same thing. You know uh, their name is um, uh, whatever. Um, da -da 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 -da. And and you for forget that you've now copied it twice. And so, generally speaking, um, you, you got to be cautious about our limited ability to notice things. And if you lo overload too much, um, sometimes you end up, uh, particularly with side effects. This is what's called a side effect. It changes something. And it's very easy to copy a bunch of things, not think about side effects, and then you get you get bit by them because suddenly you have something child incrementing by two instead of by one. Does that make sense? So you have to be a little bit cautious about it. But technically, it's perfectly correct. Yeah. Um, so, uh, so by the way, what does this return? I mean, this this value returns what the what? So, what does that value return that's in the parentheses there? And in fact, I don't even need this. I could just go like this. You don't even need parentheses. Um, <laughs> that looks weird, but <laughs> but but that actually is correct because these two are right next to each other. What is that actually returning? That, that's true, and it does it before incrementing it. So it's it's like if I child is zero um, right now, it's going to return zero there, and it's going to make I child one immediately after that. If I had done plus plus before, it would do that increment before. But yeah, okay, okay. So folks, that's um, that's the reporting of of children there. Um, so fair enough. Now. Um, Let's suppose that I wanted to record for each time someone is, so this is actually a request from someone one time. Suppose I want to have it, when it clicks on it, have it report the last time that um, they were uh, infected. Um, and, um, and, you know, all times that they were infected. Uh, so we're going to go look at that. So for this person, how would we record the last time they were infected or all times that they were infected? If we wanted to do that, where do we go? Okay, good. Good, good. Um, so, um, okay, right. Um, so this, I'm, I'm just looking, um, uh, right. So what this was is, um, so when, when people get infected here, um, there, that's, that's where it's occurring. And um, there's actually nothing, uh, nothing there. I'm trying to remember because, um, uh, right, um, get connections number, okay. So that's where I would have uh, expected it, but uh, pardon me for just a second, because I maybe no, because I'm pretty sure we did. Uh, but I, I'm wondering if actually I removed uh, I removed it. Let me let me let me just go take a look at this here. Report uh, last time infected for all persons. Okay, right. Um, so uh, this was. This this dick last time. Okay, where can we find that? Let's go. Well, this will illustrate um, use of any logic. Let's go find this dick last. Oops, last time infected uh, for person, and we could search here. Um, okay, so uh, there's. Okay, here we have two um, two two uses of it or references to it here and one here um, so uh, this is just the name it found it associated with that but then there's a save exposure and message information okay um, uh, and and then we're gonna save save away some some information here okay so this save message and exposure information um, if we wanted to find out where that was used from, we could do that successively. And let's let's see if that's used anywhere else. Aha, on receive. Okay, aha. Um, there we go, okay. Um, so 
So here we're actually, okay, I see why that's being done. Yes, 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 yes. Okay. So, no, no, it's actually, it, it, it actually needs to be that. Well, at least that's a good way for it to be. I'll explain why. Okay, so folks, what we're saving here is we are actually saving away. I didn't initially recognize why it was saying this. We're saving away the last time they were infected by a particular person and the first time they were infected by a particular person. Um, and in fact, all times that they were infected, this is the last time they were exposed by a person, okay? Um, so uh, here, we would have expected it to be here, um, the point of infection. The problem is that at this point, we don't know who it is that's exposed us or who it is that's, that's uh, infected us. So where we do have that information is in fact in this, this uh, point here in person where we have, um, and I'm, I'm going to look here, um, excuse me, it was, in, it was in the agent properties when they are on message received. And this says save exposure and infection message information. So here we have a message um, that's, presumably for, for infection, since, that, since that's the only message uh, circulating. And here we have information about who the sender is. Why do we have that information? Because that's available here. It says sender, okay? So here we have information available to us, who sent us the message. And based on that information, we're gonna save away that fact. That somebody is sending us this message uh, and uh, we're going to store that away in, in these components. So this is the uh, method here that saves that away. First of all, it's saying, okay, if we don't have um, any person sending this, uh, that's, that's fine as long as it's at the beginning of time. When might we not have, have a person sending us the message? Why might we not? So I didn't have this originally, but I was thinking it might be needed. And okay. Um, when the message is sent by the environment, this is when the message is sent via environment delivered to random at start at the sender is null. Okay. Okay. So there's a potential we, we won't have information for one case when it's sent at the very particular time. Um, but if we do have information, what we're going to do is store that information on who the sender is, and we're gonna associate that with a certain time, okay? Um, so that, that records that we've been exposed by this person, okay? We're, if, if we get to this point, we're, we're going to report that we've been exposed. Now, that, that's a different question about who infected us, because we might not be in the susceptible state. We might have gotten exposed by somebody several times, but it doesn't matter because we're not we're not susceptible. Yes. Um, funny you mentioned that. Yeah. No, that's right. Um, okay. So, folks, um, I mentioned earlier, and some might argue that I even mumbled it, um, that uh, that arrays built into top arrays are special.
can't create your own unboxed versions. It's just the ones that are built into Java. And for those, um, you uh, you have corresponding boxed ones. And, and, and most of the time, when you build your own, um, well, when you have these uh, collections, you have to refer to the boxed version. You can't refer to an unboxed. So, so a dictionary, uh, if you go look at uh, this dictionary, uh, the last time exposed per person, um, this one here, what you'll see is that it's a dictionary, um, uh, a dictionary of person and double. Java will give a problem. Watch this. Watch this. If I said I want to map a person to a lowercase double, Java will say, I don't know what to do. Um, um, dimensions expected. It doesn't know what to do. If I put double with a capital D, um, it'll be a happy camper. And um, because so I put the references were introduced because the of the variables of uh, sort of variable length, so because the string can never know how long it's a string. No. So that's why you need a reference. You can't have a array of strings because the strings can be different. Mm -hmm. But for integers and doubles, you know the length of the string symbol, right? The length of the variable symbol. Like string. So in C, that would be that would be true. In in Java, um, strings are classes. These are classes. Okay. Okay, and, and, and collections like that, uh, generics only deal with classes. Um, so, uh, so when you have a hash, you have to have a, a class here, a class there. This is the class. In the lower KT, it's not. A class has, has instances, has these particular uh, objects for it associated with that class. Persons are associated with the person class. You have any particular persons. Um, uh, that are instances of a person class. Double has many particular values that are instances of the double class. And, and um, lowercase d double, there's no class associated with it. It's a big, I, I can use some strong terms for it, but it's, 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 it's a bad thing that, they, that, that, that you have to worry about this, but, but you do. Um, and so in short, um, with a capital F. <laughs> so in short, um, you have these sort of correspondences, and it's just a pain that sometimes you're going to have to use the, the capital D double, and um, and then dumb thing, you have to you have to go put this um, when you record to it, uh, save save exposure and message information. When you record to it, you have to say new double of this thing. Um, this is actually returns a lowercase d double thing, and then you have to create a d, a capital D double sort of version of it. It's it's a pain in the butt, um, but it's it's very sort of limited. So first we store away the, just the record the last time we are exposed by the person, and we do this regardless of whether. Uh, it's already already in there, and then um, oh, this is this is so so again we we up here we um, saved away uh, the information about exposure, and now we're saving away the information about um, uh, if we were uh, infected, um, and and then um, if this is the last time we were infected, and then uh, save away information um, for all time. Um, so here, these are these only apply if we're in the susceptible state because we can't be affected by this person unless we're we're currently in susceptible. Um, and here we're saving my history information um, uh, regarding um, regarding infection. Okay, so um, here we're, we're saving away history information. Um, and in this case, um, uh, first need to check if there's already information in it. If so, we just return it and insert the, and update the time. Otherwise, we, we sort of uh, record this as the first time associated with this person. So here we have these dictionaries. These are dictionaries because we want to map from the person who's infected us to when they infected us, um, or the person that's exposed us to when they exposed us, 
and this is basically the the way we uh, we record that um, through this sort of information. So here, these dictionaries are recording our history information, saving that away, and we are uh, uh, we are uh, either updating um, the information associated with the neighbor that's exposed us, or we're we're creating a whole new record for that neighbor. Um, so that's that's a little bit of a of a different um, component that we've seen in other models. Any questions about that? Does anyone want me to go into that in more detail? Okay, um, it's a little bit of sort of uh, new new stuff there. Um, okay, so what other components are here? Um, key point is we can get access to that sender information. By the way, suppose Java didn't allow us. So Sergey was saying, like. Isn't this more confusing? Does it have to be in the message received? Why not associate with this this thing here? I agree, it would be much more transparent if it were associated with this transition. Let's suppose we want it to be associated with this transition. Um, how could we do that? Suppose jo suppose any logic didn't let you get the sender information. How would you get that then? In this case. Suppose we had this model which only has one infection in it, and there's only one type of message being sent. How could we get that information about who's the sender? Right now, we just took advantage of Java's or of any logic's niceness in packing that information away right here. But suppose we weren't so lucky. Suppose we didn't have this thing right here exposed sender. Suppose we didn't have that. Where could we get that information? Anyone? I mean, um, it's a good question. I don't think there is. I'd have to look through at this version of Java to find out, like, if when you get a message, could you somehow request who sent it? Um, that's a good question. I don't. Last I've checked, I don't. I don't think it is possible. But l and let's imagine that that you can't do it through some sort of built-in Java mechanism. How could we make it? Do it? There is a way. Just remember, folks. There's typically in in this sort of um, in building any, any uh, agent-based models. There's typically many ways to go about things. How could we do this another way if we had to engineer it ourselves? Well, I'll give you a hint. Unless, Sergey, did you want to say something? No, I was just wanted to maybe just you know look for the neighbors. Like the okay. Yeah, yeah, you might be able to do something like that. Like one records when he's about to send a message, and you look through. He, possibly, you could do something like that. But there is an additional way. Um, you'll notice this thing about message type. We can actually send information along with messages, integers, or booleans, or doubles, or strings, or other. So we could actually send along with the message. Yeah, yeah. So um, we could actually send here when we expose somebody else, instead of just sending in fact, if there's only one type of in message that's going around, really that doesn't give a lot of information. That's all there is. We don't even check it. So what we could do is we could send what? My hand is reaching for the keys. This, thank you. That's why I was reaching for the T key. Um, uh, we could send this. That would be a reference to us, to that other other person. And then they would need to unpack it. I'm, I'm, switch get back from this. They would need to unpack it right here. Um, okay, so we'd be sending a message type. We could send a person message. Um, and we could send, uh, and then right here, you'll notice in the action item, MSG is the message. Um, and uh, and so we could, from that message, you know, extract the person associated with it. I'm not even sure we need to sort of cast it since we said person here. 
and, and and then we could do whatever with it. So in other words, we could send our identity as the message, right? We really haven't made much use in this class at all of sort of being able to send information with the message. For the most part, we've sort of had one message type, but you could send information about who you are. You could send information about you know the nature of this contact or or the um, level of closeness of the contact or whatever along with this message and that's useful that's useful so arguably this can be done more nicely as Sergey was sort of saying by maybe associating it with this with this uh, transition here and just having it unpack the message turn it into a person that's infecting us and storing it there does that make sense Okay, okay. So um, that's that's some um, some other components. Okay, here's another component. This links into some things we've been talking about recently. Um, here we have a bunch of functions. Where do you think these are used? Random sex. It randomly selects a given sex. Random ethnicity randomly selects a given ethnicity. Random age randomly selects age. Um, where do you think those are used from? We actually saw them used a little bit ago. Yeah, yeah. When you're creating like an initial population, and where else do you think random ethnicity and random sex might be used, if not random age? Where else might that be used? Well, at least where, where may random sex be used? A baby, yeah, that's right, that's right. So, um, okay, so here, when a woman goes from a pregnant state to a non-pregnant state, she performs birth, and in perform birth, we add to the population, and we call random sex here. Okay, why don't we call random ethnicity? Where does this ethnicity come from? Yeah, this is the ethnicity here of the mother because we're, we're not simulating the father's role. Um, but but random. <laughs> uh, okay, so this is an interesting question. Um, uh, okay, so so maybe maybe we'll deal with that right now. Um, okay, so one issue is scope scope of the model. What? So so let's suppose we wanted to keep track of the father for this baby. So imagine that we had an algorithm that allows us to combine the mother's characteristics with the father's characteristics to create the characteristics for the baby. And, and it might be at the genetic level, at the level of alleles, um, you know, and loci, or it might be at the level of, um, of, of just sort of uh, rough characteristics, eye color, whatever. Um, whatever characteristics you want. Uh, ethnicity might be one of them. Um, let's suppose we wanted to do that. Where, how would we store that information? <laughs> well, well, wait, okay. <laughs> so, uh, so if we wanted to keep track of who the father was, what would we do? Okay, so, so we're all set here. When the baby gets born, we want to determine its characteristics based on the father. Where, where do we get the father's information from? I'm actually trying to stir up some discussion here to think, because it's a very interesting issue, and it's an issue with a little bit of, of intellectual depth to it. How do we store that information? Okay, so, so let's suppose we wanted the father's ethnicity. Okay. Okay. Uh huh. Put a name for the mother and the name for the father. You just need to be consistent as far as which one comes first. Okay. So, or better, yeah, we could put a reference to the father and to the mother. But where would that information be stored? So, so suppose we had that information, and it doesn't even need to be an array because there's only two of them. We might just have two variables. And you could do it with a two-person array. It just it might be easier to do with two variables. Where would we store that information? Associated with what? Okay, which person? Okay, with the mother. So, so the mother might have information about the father. Or, or a reference. Okay. Or 
Okay. And that information would be created at what point? That is it. That's what I'm trying to get at. So, so that information would need to be saved away from the point where the mother becomes pregnant, right? Because it's at that point that we know who the father is, presumably. <laughs> uh, well spoken. Um, that, that, that's right. So the father knows that, or the model knows who the father is at this point. Um, and uh, and so uh, at this point, the mother would, um, the mother's class, when she becomes pregnant, she would save away information on the, the other person involved, the male involved, and that information would be stored in a variable, perhaps, that's like um, uh, father or something like that. Or, well, excuse me, it's father of, of, of for, for current pregnancy or something like that. And then when she gives birth, then we would might pass to perform birth who the father is, for example. And in perform birth, it might use the father's information to determine this, right? So in short, ladies and gentlemen, we would have to, where there's this delay, we would have to store away information about the father from point of conception to point of birth, right? And then, because we're only instantiating the baby into the population at that point of birth, that's when, that's when that information saved away about the father would be used. Does that make sense? Okay, so it's, it's a little bit textured there. So similarly, like if you want to store away, I don't know, where, um, well, yeah, I mean, you might want to store away information on a father. That's not a crazy idea at all. So you could have family trees within this model. You could then do statistics on along the lines of some things that Chris and I have been talking about. You could then do, you know, potentially sort of simulate the effect of doing statistics to take into account family history information in the model and, and, uh, and you know, examine the reliability of certain measures that take into account family history information. So um, you, could create, you could create a simulation of contact tracing where you take into account the particular family structure. So saving away that father information is not at all a crazy idea, but you would have to do the key recording of who the father is when the pregnancy first occurs at conception, and then that information would then be used at time of birth to instantiate the baby's characteristics. All right? Okay. So, so fair enough. Um, uh, in, in this model, I didn't take that into account. I did record for that person who their mother is. Um, but I did not record who's their daddy. Um, and here, let's look at these other pieces of information. In fact, we could find out sort of what each of these does. Okay, so there's, there's uh, age, there's ethnicity, there's the baby sex, and then there's, are they initially infected? And then, um, by the way, notice that it creates documentation on your own little, um, uh, own little thing. And then who, who their mother is. Um, okay, so uh, that's useful. Um, by the way, this is their mother, right? Um, this is a reference to a person. It's just a parameter like any other parameter. It's, it's uh, created uh, at that time of, of performed birth. In the initial model, we don't keep track of whose who's mother is who. Um, this random sex, that chooses among random sex. Now, Again, how would you encode? How would you encode the different sexes, male or female? Zero one would be one way. What would be another way to do it? Quotes and strings, male, female. Good. Well, what's another way that we've discussed? Yes. E yes. Exactly. In um, you, you give your own names to it. That's exactly it. So, what would be the trade-off? Zero and one. Well, I argued it can mean different things in different circumstances. String, quote, male, quote, female. What might be the problem with that? What sort of problem could come up? Believe me, if you've spent so many years doing software development, you've seen these things before. Exactly, you can miss. Exactly. It's like there's no standardization. There's no enforcement 
that, oh, you've done it inconsistently. There's no way of it kind of knowing that you mean the same thing with lowercase male and uppercase male. Um, so I have a friend who um, is, is an amazing car mechanic, and he's given me some advice while I'm trying to fix my car. And he said, um, believe me, every single thing that can possibly go wrong when you're doing the car, he's seen before. He's made the mistake. He's gotten burnt by it. So he has a lot of good advice on, you know, yes, be sure to prop it up on the axle props while you're changing the tires and so on, because he's had it roll on his foot or something, you know. Um, it's like every single thing. And that's the way it is with software development with me. I Believe me, I've seen the misspellings and so on. So, so here, this is something that will force us to be consistent. Because if we said lowercase, you know, male, and we tried to build this thing, it would say, I don't know what you're talking about. And if you, if you capitalize it properly, it will be a happy camper. So here you're using, you're using Java, you're using any logic um, use of the build to, to enforce convention, to enforce consistency. And enums are your friends. They are similarly your friends for uh, encoding other things like uh, ethnicity. And we've seen actually with ethnicity um, that, uh, and we'll, we'll go to this here. This, this is a little bit more advanced. Okay, so here's the declaration of the enums. Um, uh, so male, female, and here's a bunch of ethnicities. Now for random ethnicity, what this actually does is it kind of punts and it just, it just uh, returns a sort of uh, with equal likelihood any one of them. But the interesting thing is we can actually ask, okay, give us all the ethnicities as an, what sort of thing might you ask for the array of? A, this is an, begins with a capital A, it's an array. This is an array that this returns. Um, so this is an array of all the different possible ethnicities. We can ask, we ask for it, and then we can just ask for its length. And then we can say, okay, get me a random number from zero to that length minus one. And then we can just look up in all those values, find the ith one. So basically the first here would be, if, if, if that was zero, it would be a First Nations person, second would be a Métis, third would be East Asian, fourth would be South Asian. In short, we can get kind of an array of all these values and return the ith one. Does that make sense? Oh, oh okay. Um, that's implicit with, it's a good question. It's, it's implicit with this uh, next, uh, excuse me. Uh, it's implicit with this next next int, I believe. Um, I believe it's it's from this to minus one, but I'd have to, I'd have to double check that, yeah. Um, okay, so anyway, those are um, using Java to your, um, to your gain. Um, by using um, by using these enums. Notice that any logic doesn't seem to provide explicit use of enums, but this is your friend. Um, you just have to put them into this additional class code. Okay. Um, okay. I think that's uh, most of the things here. Um, uh, notice for finalized death, we just requested it remove the member. Um, I think I think those are all the sort of salient characteristics I wanted to show from, from, from this model. Um, okay, right. Um, uh, okay, uh, right. Um, this immigrant arrival, um, yeah, this is just when people come into the population. Um, uh, yeah, um, we, we create a new a new person with these characteristics. Uh, we assume they're uniformly distributed between zero and the oldest age group. We, they're random ethnicity, random sex, and and that we have a certain prevalence of infection. Um, let's suppose we wanted vertical transmission. How would we accomplish that? How would we accomplish vertical transmission? We wanted a baby to be infected if the mother was infected, or if, if we want a certain chance that they were infected if the mother were infected. Where would that occur? That would occur at point. So when are the baby's characteristics defined? They're char defined. Sorry, yeah, pregnant to not pregnant. That's when we perform birth. Okay, 
And what, how would we how do we set the baby to become infected? Yes, yes, okay. And in fact, if you look at this, there's an is initially infected, okay? Now, that is initially infected. Let's suppose, and, it, and not only that though, folks, um, I would argue that if you went up to population here, we also, in population, we have a certain, well, here, yeah, it's a certain, um, uh, a certain uh, chance there. It, this is the chance here. Um, they have a certain chance, remember it's true or false, and, um, and here we just take a random form, uniform value from zero to one, and if it's less than the initial prevalence of infection, it's mostly initial prevalence of infection is 10%. Um, so it's 0 0.1 is the initial prevalence of infection. Uh, uniform value, it's being drawn between zero and one, and suppose we get, most of the time, we're not going to get something that's less than 0.1. So most of the time, this is going to be false, right? If the initial prevalence of infection were zero, this would never be true, right? And no one would be infected. Um, the initial prevalence of infection were one, basically every, t yeah, every time, as long as this doesn't go to the upper bound of exactly one. So we should probably... We might have to be check the definition of, of how this is defined. But the point is, essentially every time, they're going to be infected. So this is a way of determining that. Now, if we wanted that to occur when the baby is born, the uh, vertical transmission, what would we do for that here? For performed birth, how would we, how would we implement vertical transmission here? For this initially infected, what would we pass? Oh, the mother is, is infected yeah, pass whether the mother is infected. And in fact, we ask this dot is infected. Why do I ask this? Why do I ha say this dot is infected? Why not? Why not just put a big, big expression there? Ask if they're in this state, for example. After all, this is the expression. Why not just stick that in there? Why not just stick that in? Yeah. 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 I mean, so if I stuck that in there, first of all, I'd have to kind of look at it and say, okay, let's see, let's look at the state chart, and then ask, okay, then that must be to determine if they're infective or not. It's a little bit clearer to name it this. Second thing is, um, if I might, if I used it from a lot of places, it'd be better to have it one place with with a short name. Another thing is, maybe I have several infective states. Maybe I have infect. Maybe I have a distinction between infected and infective later. And actually, I want to know is, are they infected, regardless of whether or not they're infective? All and so I might check that they're. Are they in one of two states or one of five states? It's much better if I just have a, or at least it's arguably better that I, that I have a, a method name is infected. And that abstracts away from the details of the state chart. You don't have to look at all those details, okay? Um, so anyway, those are some uh, characteristics here of this model. I think those are most of the things here. Um, okay, um, so any, Mm, 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 mm. So let's let's rehearse um, one other thing here. Suppose, oh yeah, yeah. Oh okay, this is a. Uh, eh. Should I discuss this now or leave this for later? Um, uh, yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, I think I'm gonna leave that till uh, a future. Um, Friday or, or next Wednesday. Um, yeah, so, so folks, um, remember this whole issue about why statistics can be slow. So you remember, where do statistics live? If I want to find statistics to count the number of infected people, where would I go? Okay, Maine, and where in Maine? Uh, actually, it's in, it's in this guy here. 
It's in the, yeah, yeah, yeah. And in fact, I have an infection stat, okay? Um, and, and I said that, that has many virtues to recommend it. What's the problem? Count them all up. So if I had lots of statistics, it would keep on going over the population every time. So let's, let's go see that again. If I argued, okay, click there, control J. There we go. And you can see it's a loop over every person in the population just for this one statistic. Okay. Um, if we have many statistics and we're calculating all of them, that is not good with a capital N um, and G. Um, so uh, what I did here is um, I actually have a, uh, a thing which loops over the population once but counts the number of people who match different specifications. So for each person in the population, I loop and I sort of count the number that match different specifications. So one specification might be, are they in zero to four, another five to nine, uh, what have you. And, and I can sort of classify them accordingly. But this, to understand this, ladies and gentlemen, will require two small, uh, two, two, two lectures. And I'm gonna... You, you could do that, for example. I, I can't remember right now where it's, where it's done, but, but it could be done very readily. Um, or it could be done on a periodic basis just to record it to a database or whatever. But can, you, can you perform it only when you invoke this? Uh, yeah, yeah, it's when you call this, it is, you say, compute this, and, and it will go. They, they yeah, that, that's right. That's, that's right. Um, okay, and, and we'll actually see another model where this is, is used. Um, uh, in this flu immuno epi model. Um, I think I uploaded this to the website and before we, before Friday, I'd like you to download this because this is actually a fairly sophisticated model, the flu immuno epi model in terms of calculating, um, calculating uh, sort of the number that meets different, different uh, criteria, okay? And it will show you some, some capabilities there. But first I want to, um,